Pat Johnson is from the city that is synonymous with rock and roll, Cleveland, Ohio. He's been shooting every band forever. And he's got a book out called Blue Collar Photographer. He... The book is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you can see it at his website, patjohnson.com. Pat was Journey's official photographer and took the very first Journey promotional shots in his studio in San Francisco. He also shot the Wild Dogs Man's Best Friend cover and my Dr. Mastermind cover. If it happened in rock and roll, Pat was there. His book, Blue Collar Photographer, has been out for a while and available at Amazon. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Gino, and this is my favorite show with my favorite guy. Let's welcome your host, Matt McCord. Welcome to the show. We're talking to the great photographer, Pat Johnson. And a better question would be, who haven't you photographed? Hi, Pat. How are you? I'm good. Fine. Uh, Well, I never shot the Beatles, but they're sort of before my time. Um, the one thing I never got to do was shoot Iggy Pop in my studio. Uh, his manager tried to get him in there numerous times, but whenever he'd play in the Bay Area, but he bolt out the next morning. That was always a regret because I was, you know, the famous picture of Iggy on people's shoulders. You know, I don't know if you know that, the beginning of punk. Well, um, I was in Cincinnati Pop Festival on acid, and we squirreled up front to see the traffic. And this band comes out called the Stooges. It, you know, it blew our minds. They never saw them. You know, the new guys out of Detroit. They're bad vibe and everybody. Iggy jumps in the crowd, smears peanut butter. He's at my feet, and there, I have outtakes of that shot. And there, there I am right there. So I fell in love with Iggy from that day on. But I never got him in my studio. Um, you know, and I don't know. You know, it's funny. At one point years ago, when the Stones were playing at, at Pac Bell, and my studio was on South Park, which you'd been to, it was right down the street from Pac Bell. My late wife and I are at the concert, and we got a buzz on. And I turned to her and go, well, I failed. And she goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, I grew up in Cleveland. So I grew up on, to me, rock and roll was the Rolling Stones, Humble Pie, Spooky Tooth, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, the MC5. You know, Iggy and the Stooges, uh, Cactus. You know, that, that was Cleveland. You know, Cleveland's like freezes in the winter and thousand degrees in the summer. And, you know, you party like crazy, you know. And uh, I always never liked the Eagles because they and still don't. They bored the shit out of me. And uh, so I I didn't, I never really got to shoot the, the those kind of guys. And then she looks at me and goes, you're out of your mind. You know, but I ultimately did. <laughs> so does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. I, I I love Humble Pie. I saw them in Portland in 1980, and they blew out all the horns of the PA. Of course. I, got to, I interviewed Fastway, where Jerry Shirley played drums in that band, and it was great. Yeah, I loved Humble Pie. And I, I'm a punk rocker. I saw the Ramones the first time they came through Portland. I was into that in 1976 and 7. That music just spoke to me. My first album is punk and new wave called The Ravers. So yeah, when you I know, got to the Wild Dogs, it was like, okay, well, I'll do this now. But I was <laughs> in the punk scene. You know, um, um, I had a problem. I went to the Buhay Garden, the second show, and I, I saw all these guys, these, in my mind, trust fund phonies, wannabe junkies, putting knee pads and elbow pads on their, sh- and then jumping in the crowd. And there was, you know, people outside yelling at the straights. And, and I, I, you know, I, unfortunately for me, 
I thought it was I thought it was a lot of pre pretensions pretentious assholes. So I kind of got I never really became a Mabuhe Garden guy, you know. I just thought it was a bunch of pretentious assholes, and they'd call me a pretentious asshole, you know, because I like I photographed Journey, who were like sellouts to them, you know. But uh, but you know, I I, ca I contacted a friend of mine who was one of the Mabuhe photographers because I was putting working on a Journey project. And I said, hey, do you have any shots of Journey at this point? He goes, I never shot Journey. I didn't like him. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, the hell, what kind of attitude is this? You know, my philosophy was, you know, and I shot I shot the Clash and I shot the Mutants. And, you know, I shot them all in, in a way. I didn't shoot the Dills and, and those guys, you know. The, but uh, um, my philosophy was I liked everybody I shot. You know, I mean, or the third, you know, how do, how do you how do you make a living you know like everything you do or don't fucking do it you know and so i mean i i was for the longest time i had the biggest photography collection of hip hop in the world probably you think i was a hip hop guy and i was going yo 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 no but i grew to like it you know i've got portraits of tupac in my book and eminem and snoop dogg and you know, I love Snoop Dogg. I, I, yeah, I love, I love all that of them. Doggy saw. That's some real genius going on there, with all the the, the cuts from uh, Funkadelic. Yeah, yeah. I've been on stage with Funkadelic. I went to a, I was at a Robin Trower show, and a friend of mine who worked for the concert promoter said, "I got to go up and do the count out at the Paramount for uh, George Clinton." And I said, "I'd rather be there." Can she goes, "Show up in ten minutes, and I'll get you backstage." So I went there as the only white guy there. I'm standing on the side of the stage. There's a party going on with well dressed people, and George comes over, grabs me in a bear hug and drags me, dances me back to the middle of the stage and with a big swoop of his hand says, you know, kind of like, look, and I've always wanted to be on that stage. And I was out there dancing for like 10 minutes. That was great. Then he walked me over to the bar and told the bartender, give him whatever he wants. And man, that was great. I, I, loved, I loved that band and funk. Yeah, but, I did too. I really, I really loved I funk. What I don't like is music, music people who are prejudiced against something that they aren't doing. Oh, yeah. You know? Music That's is just like saying. food. And I think, you know, it's a buffet. And you can find something that you'll like if you taste everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you uh, ever shoot Poison Idea, a punk band from Portland? No, I never heard of them. You got to put the speaker up there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, also with Journey, you know, Dean, the drummer for Wild Dogs, plays with Journey now. I know. Yeah, I know. And uh, if you listen to the first two Journey albums, that's some of the best music ever made before I, Steve Perry. Dean can sing too. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love Dean. Yeah, he's a fun guy. Yeah, we did some amazing album covers, you, you and me. Oh, yeah, the, the dog one was crazy. Mike Barney, I talked with, to him last week, and he was laughing about how the guys were up on chairs, and uh, my ex-wife and I were foaming up the dog with fake foam and fake blood. And that yeah, backdrop, egg, egg white. Egg white. Yeah. When, that backdrop that we used was used for Boy George for, uh, I think, a Life or Time magazine cover. Yeah, it was like uh, three days before. It was for a Japanese tour. Oh, yeah, I put them in my uh, in my softball team uniforms, the Phantoms. Is this going to work with you holding the speaker like with the phone there? Well, maybe. <laughs> All right, can okay. you add it? I I like Boy George too. I, mean, I do too. I mean, just music is like I said. It's you can find some good in everything. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, the, the certain. I'm not. I'm not a fan of modern country. Yeah, it's more like rock and roll guys who couldn't make it as rock and roll guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like that, bastardized Rolling Stones music. Yeah, and they're arrogant and they're kind of a redneck. Uh, you know, uh, well, I won't even get into politics, but um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I uh, as you probably know, I, I released my book last year called Blue Collar Photographer. 
and I'm really quite proud of it. It's it's been it's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so you, you can buy it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame store. It's in their archives. You know, the they've they've got all my images in their archives, so it's pretty cool. To cool. You know, and to get back to Journey, when Journey walked out on the to be inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the photograph they walked out to was my photograph. And actually brought tears to my eyes, to be honest with you. That's awesome. Yeah, and I still hang out with Ross, the bass player, quite a bit. And Neil, Sean wrote something nice for my book. And, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, and a lot of these go, oh, Journey, they, oh, shut up, you know. Ross Valerie was in Steve Miller on my favorite album, Rock Love. I love Steve Miller, early Steve Miller. And yeah. I was reading uh, Les Paul's book, and in Les Paul's book, he said that Les's dad, or Steve Miller's dad, was Les Paul's dentist. Yeah, I think he's. Just, I think um, Steve Miller is um, married to Les Paul's daughter. I think. I think he was a. a the Godfather at his wedding or something. Something, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so how long has this book been out? Um, it's been out for uh, about a year, and it's a it's been really a, a fun project because I was never one of those guys that walked around and I did my photo shoots and then tried to sell them to you know have to the agencies at the time. If I did a shoot for Mike Varney, Wild Dogs. I did the shoot for Mike Varney, Wild Dogs. We did the best ones we could pick out. I put them away and I didn't look at them again. And then I'm on to the next one, like Boy George. And then two days later, it was you guys. And so, as a, you know, I've always been kind of keep, keeping an eye on my stuff. But when the pandemic hit, if you remember the first three months, you were like, you know, if you, you, you were scared to brush your teeth, you know, so you could, so you, we all just sat in the house. So I had attacked my book and um, Joel Selvin, uh, uh, he worked really hard on helping me put it together. And I, I hired uh, Pamela Turley to do my, to edit it. And we did, they did a phenomenal job. And, you know, I've always, the, the reason is that blue, Joel came up with the title blue collar photographer, because I, you know, I wasn't a blowhard and you knew me. I never bragged. You never, you know, I never talked about myself. I can't, I can't stand people to talk about themselves. Me. Hey, let's, let me tell you about me. Look, oh yeah. Me, you know, me, my, I me, me. I hate those fucking guys. Just like you probably do. You, you, you're a pretty straight shooter. And so, you know, I grew up on the West side of Cleveland, which is in, in those days was very ethnically broken up. Uh, like the only famous person out of my neighborhood which was, you know, industrial, the biggest Ford plant out of Detroit, the biggest Chevy plant out of Detroit. You either became worked in the Ford plant or tool and die shops, or you went to college, sort of. And the only other guy that from my neighborhood that made it big was uh, Benny Ben Orr from the Cars. His name was Ben Orr Chukowski. He's a Polak from Parma Heights, and he was in a band when I was growing. I didn't know him when I was growing up, you know, in, in the Grasshopper. So... You know, I, I was from really a blue collar neighborhood. You know, my, at one point my mom worked in a factory, you know, and uh, not later on in life, but nonetheless, as I was a little boy, my mother worked in a, you know, a, a steel mill factory. And then when I moved out here as a photographer, I was a working stiff. I worked hard. You know, I never really, I wasn't really good at promoting myself. So I never really may had the $20,000 clients I had the, the you know million five hundred dollar clients, seven hundred dollar clients, like wild dogs or whoever, you know, and and occasionally I'd hit it with the journey or somebody, but the, my bread and butter was you know the small stuff. So I'm a blue collar guy. I don't know if that makes any answers means anything to you. No, that, that does to me. I'm the same kind of guy. Up until the COVID, I was delivering copy paper boxes of copy paper for the college, the community college I went to school at. Yeah. Oh, man, that gave me a heart attack, or not heart attack, a uh, stroke. I'd, my blood pressure was up to 289 over 169. <laughs> they said, oh, you're a record holder. They go, okay, I want, I want a trophy, <laughs> my picture on the wall. <laughs> and I'm better now, but uh, 
man, I worked my butt off. Yeah, for 20 years, I did. I, I started out writing parking tickets. <laughs> I was working in the movies, and then they priced themselves out of Portland area. And uh, on 9-11, my girlfriend was working at the same college, and uh, she said, here's a perfect job for you. And I said, what is it? She said, well, you walk around, you talk to people. And I kept asking her, what, what's the job? And I'm watching planes go through the buildings on TV. She never called early in the morning. And I, you know, didn't have anybody calling me for work. She said, just go in. It's writing parking tickets. Oh, I can do that. It's like a standard. What a wreck you are. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of fun. I met a lot of people and, you know, made friends. That, yeah. you know, people do things for friends that they won't do for authority figures. And I just took that approach and didn't have to write too many tickets. I could buy a dollar parking pass for the day. <laughs> did we, uh, when we photographed, did you come down from Portland? Yeah, or I live here. here. I live in my mom's attic, actually, for the last 20 years, 30 well, when years. When you came, when we did the wild dog stuff for shrapnel, were you living up in Portland and you came down yeah. for that? Yes. I got to tell you, Mike Varney was, was an amazing, what he did was amazing. And he's, he doesn't get near the recognition he deserves, man. He discovered so many young kids from all over the country and world that, that, you know, uh, sent them their shred metal guitar shit. And, and he, you know, he took these guys under his wings and with shrapnel records and man made, you know, he made some stars out of that, you know, and oh, yeah. good for Mike. He was a character, but I like Mike Varney. Oh, man, I saw Mike Varney on MTV. J.J. Jackson said, if you got a guitar player that is good, this guy's looking for people, get a pen, we'll be right back. So I got a pen, wrote down the, the address, and we sent him a tape, and that's what, how it started. That's amazing. Yeah, that's how it, that's how it started. And, boy, that love- Wild Dogs cover was fucking amazing. Yeah, that was, that was his idea. Yeah. And, yeah, it was fun setting it up, and uh, I did. I set up the uh, Doctor Mastermind cover too. That was his idea, but I actually composed it. You know, hung all those dolls, and yeah, they were a combination of his toys and my toys, or uh, yours. No, not mine. I didn't yeah. have. No, in fact, that clown behind just scared me now. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a, an accumulator of silly stuff. I've always liked that kind of stuff. You know, like. Uh, my studio in South Park for 10 years was the Gibson Guitar Showroom. So I got all kinds of Gibson guitars. Wow. Yeah. So in- I remember looking at pictures in like record store racks in your studio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think I'm pretty sure that I remember seeing like a love end at the Golden Gate Bridge, Golden Gate Park. Who? Pictures of that. Uh, you're Love in? No, I moved here in, from Cleveland in 71, so I missed the hippie days. Oh, maybe you just had them there. Yeah, I could have, yeah. But um, uh, Cleveland, there was no, we, you, you should lower. In Cleveland, there was no such thing as hippies. Go ahead, back it up. Well, yeah. I'll say it again. There was no such thing as hippies in Cleveland. Somebody gave us the peace sign. We, we thought they were a narc, and we bolted as far away as fast as we can, you know. <laughs> Cleveland was like, you know, by the time I was 20 years old, I'd been robbed at gunpoint and robbed at knife point, you know? So we didn't, there was no hippie ethos there, you know? I sell, I sell rec CDs and t-shirts and uh, I sell a lot in Ohio and Wisconsin and Illinois. And uh, those people seem to be, Nice, nicer people than in Oregon. I haven't sold any CDs here. You know, Cleveland. I can speak for Cleveland. They love the rock and roll, and I, I see your stuff on that you sell on the on the Facebook and whatnot. And they love rock and roll. You know, the Eagles. Eh, you know what I'm saying? They want. You know, it's fucking. It's like five degrees. You know, all winter, and it's 99 in the summer. So, you know, they want, they want their, they want to rock, you know, Humble Pie, MC5, you know, that's what I grew up on. I mean, I love the Jefferson Airplane just as much, but like I say, I wanted to go east and go to New York and London and 
the Stones and Keith Richards are God, you know, and you know, I, I'm still not a Grateful Dead guy. I mean, I photographed them, but, you know, I like their first couple albums, but they, to me, that's noodling, you know. I like five songs by the Grateful Dead. Yeah, about did me you, too. Yeah. Did you say the gods? No. Oh, I thought you said the gods. No, uh, uh-uh. no, they, 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 they were, they, they were just noodling to me. It was you know, it was boring. No, you I'm know? saying the band, the gods. No, never heard of them. Oh, they, they toured with Angel. Oh, uh, okay. Like uh, some in like the seventies. No, no, uh. Uh-uh. So, got any questions? Um, uh, you mentioned something about Sammy Hagar has a quote on your book. Did you shoot an album cover by him? Uh, shoot a, I shot Sammy a million times. Um, yeah, I like Sammy Hagar a lot. He, he is, what you see is what you get. You know, I asked him, I, you know, I called him, say, hey, Sammy, goes, yeah, what's up? Would, would you write a quote for my book? And he goes, yeah. I mean, he writes, Pat's a badass behind the lens, you know. That's thanks, Sammy. I was so fucking cool. But I could tell you some funny stories. Like the picture of the stones in my book. How I got that is I was hired by the San Jose Mercury News. They were doing Sunday supplement, little po- fold out posters, things in the middle. And the and uh, the first one they wanted was the stones. So they hired me, and there was no photo passes in those days. You just went. And I squirreled my way up front. I brought a biker buddy of mine. You know, we got as far up close as I could. In those days, these idiots slept overnight for two days to get up front. And I get up front, and my buddy gets the biker buddy gets down on his knees. I turned to the people around me and said, Look, I'll only be here 10 minutes. Give him my card. Call me. I'll send you a print. He gets down. I get up on his knees like, like a chick with no top on. Took two rolls of film, got down and left. And we got great photos of the stones, you know. Um I told you the Iggy Pot one. I'll tell you a funny one. Meatloaf is probably not one of your favorites, but nonetheless, I had to fight, photograph Meatloaf to promote his Bad Out of Hell album. Oh, I, I, I saw that tour. That guy was amazing. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Oh, he brought the mic and sing in the Paramount Theater, and he didn't need a PA. Yeah. And this was, this was, he was playing it at, at um, the, uh, uh, one of the clubs in San Francisco before that. And so, he, he, they do, they go up and perform. My mother, who's like a, you know, five foot tall, little Italian woman, uh, from who I brought her with me because she was visiting from Cleveland. And after the show, we're standing around with my little, my mother, and uh, everyone's fired. Somebody fires up a joint. Meatloaf takes a puff of the joint and hands it, tur- turns the hand to my mother, and she looks and goes, No, thank you, meatball. You know, and everyone, you know, pissed <laughs> themselves laughing, you know. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a good career. I've been a lucky man. You know, I still to this day say I, I can't believe that, I, that I, was, I was able to do that coming from where I came from, you know. So your book is on Amazon, but where else is it? Um, it's on Amazon. You can, get it at, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, on their website. And you can get it on my on my website, www.patjohnson.com. It's self-published. You know, the to get a uh, publisher, I would have had to find an agent, which would have taken me a year. And then he would have went out and hustled it, and it would have taken another year. And then w- with all this China boats getting stuck out there, uh, it would have taken another three years, even if they if they to get it back here. So I thought, well, Christ, I'll, I'll do it myself. So I... You know, borrowed money and printed them myself. So are you still shooting bands and stuff? Or Yeah, I mean, yeah, as, as, you, as you as well know that the music industry is sort of a dead dead item now, you know. Um, who's big now? There is, you know, you, you know, it's either oldies bands coming back or it's Lady Gaga, who I think is cool, but nonetheless... That stuff is, you know, the radio doesn't pick up bands, you know, like, you know, they're not going to promote a, a young band like Santana when they started and build them up. So then the, the music industry is pretty much dead. And then the digital camera phone, any moron with a fucking phone thinks they're a photographer. And so, yeah, I still do. I still do it, but not like I did. No, no you're right. The, the music 
business is just not the same as it, as I remember it. And I started going to concerts when I was 11, 1971. And there'd only be like two bands on the bill and the place would be sold out because there's nothing else to do. I think a lot of it also had to do with the Vietnam War being going and uh, the draft. And so people had a different, they didn't complain as much about little crap like they do today. Huh. They like are, we're out for a good time. Yep. I know. I, I saw somebody, I forget who it was, U2 or something was playing and to get the shitty seats are like, you know, $2,000 or 700 bucks. Hey, screw you, you know? And they're and, they play in such vast places. They look like they're on a, in a little aquarium. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's no clubs anymore. I mean, for, you know, when you were coming up and I was coming up, you know, there was so many clubs where, you know, the wild dogs or Dr. Mastermind could go out and hone their craft. You could, you could go out and stink the first time. And the second time you get a little better. And a year later, you're pretty good. And two years later, you're pretty goddamn good. But there is no places like that anymore. I mean, and then it's San Francisco. You live like in Portland? No, the, like in San Francisco, the Stone and the Waldorf. I saw Motorhead at the Waldorf. They were great. Now, yeah. 1981, before I played there myself. And uh, no, in Portland, they had an earthquake ordinance where they tore down 70 clubs that used to have music because it was either rebuild to earthquake standards or they'd shut you down, close you down, tear them down, and put they put up all these concrete apartment buildings like they're waiting for people to move here. Yeah, Portland's a strange town. I, I, I go there like once a year for a day or two because my girlfriend's family's up there. It's a strange, Portland's an odd town. It's really odd. My girlfriend works for the same college that we always did, but she works at the building downtown. She says pretty much everything's closed up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a strange town. You know, um, and I don't mean politically, because I probably agree with the politics, but it's just a strange town. You, you know, we'd go somewhere at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it takes a friggin' hour because there, there's those, all those bridges, you know. No, I'm 64, 64 and a half. How old are you now? I'll be 73 in May, so. Wow, you look yeah. good. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I still play softball, you know, like, you know, like goof with, with the 18, 20-year-olds. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, my photo career, let's get back off the politics. It was really good. I had a lot of fun, you know, uh. Um, I shot James Brown. I have portraits of James Brown, and you know, you name them, I've shot them. You know, um, God damn, uh, Elvin Bishop was one of my first. A cute story. My first album cover where I got photo credit was actually Elvin Bishop. My first photo ever on an album was uh, Ian Hunter, All American Alien Boy, a poor picture of uh, Ainsley Dunbar that I had taken while it was a journey, but I never got photo credit. But in my most recent album cover that I did was Elvin Bishop. So it was a really cool full circle. Elvin yeah. Bishop from the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, you know, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. And, man, I saw pictures that you sent me today. There's Elton John, David Bowie, Grace Slick, Jerry Garcia. Uh, God, I could keep going. Michael Jackson. Yeah. J yeah Mr. Mike Brown. My friend played drums in his opening band with Tommy Ray, who was his wife, had his last wife, Jane Brown. And he told me that they had a escape pole in the office. So when James would come in and he was high, they all said, you got to gotta leave. And they'd jump down this pole into the parking garage and get in the cars and leave. Because he'd come oh, in that's and shoot funny. the office up. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You had to call him Mr. Brown. Yeah. Mr. Brown, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he talked like he thought. Hey, but, but, you know, he the I shot him a couple of times, and the one time was at Nardo Michael Walden's place, a record producer in Marin. And so Mr. Brown comes in and he goes, you know, he goes, Yo, hey, hey, you know, I met the Pope, the Pope, the Pope, the Pope likes my music. And he sends out, you know, and I look at him and I go, hey, you know, I have two people that I admire with similar names, you and the great Jim Brown, the running back from the Cleveland Browns. 
And he looks at my Cleveland Indian hat and he goes, I love the Atlanta Braves. You know, I'm a, if I had milk in my mouth, I'd have snotted out my nose all over his shirt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said he'd come in smoking sermons and uh, everybody had to leave. Man, I, I saw that Woodstock 99. Did you, have you seen that movie? No. Oh, man, just... It's not the same as the old days. They <laughs> they blew the place up. It was at a uh, Air Force base. And so they blew all the food carts up and the propane tanks. It was it's it's been on Netflix forever. It's like a nutty thing. But the promoter was just giving James Brown just a load of crap. I'm surprised he get didn't get knocked out. Oh, I have to look for that. I was I went to the original Woodstock, you know. Uh, you know, did, a, did you stay for Hendrix? No. There was all <laughs> these rumors that Bob Dylan was going to show up and the Rolling Stones and and Jimi Hendrix and all these people. And you, you know, you were there for like three days. You didn't take a piss or a shit for three days almost. Ran out of cigarettes the first day. All the weed you could smoke uh, and sleeping on the mud. And and, and uh so Monday morning, we get up and we start leaving and everything stank of Woodstock. It reeked. And we're walking and we're about a mile away and we hear, wah, wah, wah. And we go, oh, fuck. That's Hendrix. What's Monday morning? Yeah. And then we First thing in the morning. Said, ah, we'll see him again. So, and then we kept going and I never saw Hendrix play. My mom brought home a, an album called Woodstock 2, which is the second album of Woodstock. And it was a two album set that had Mountain and I love Mountain. That's where I found Mountain. And I saw Leslie West's picture in, in your book. That was for Mike Varney. I saw I saw him on the Lake of Fire tour when they came through with that with Richie Scarlett and uh, the drummer and uh Wow. Yeah, I know. Again, growing up in the Cleveland area, they had these pop festivals and it was basically Alice Cooper, Grand Funk. I never liked Grand Funk, but anyhow, Grand Funk, Mountain, The Stooges, the MC5, um, the uh, 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 Cactus. You know, you could, th that says it all. Just every one of those bands were in that same sort of Midwest, blah, you know, Detroit hot, rock. Hot you know, the Cac uh, James Gang. You know, that's the shit that we would go see. Where out here they were going to psychedelic land and seeing you know the dead, and and to us it was our our psych psychedelic land was you know Grand Funk and Mountain and Alice Cooper and those were the bands that played at all the con all the pop festivals. Yeah. Kick know? out the jazz, motherfucker! Yeah, I, I love the MC Five, uh, uh, but you know you you, you kind of had to be there to get them. But anyhow. When I interviewed Lemmy from Motorhead, he uh, said he wanted a band that was like MC5. I could see that. I could see that. He was a cool guy. Yeah, he seemed like a cool guy. I, the You know, the metal guys I know in the Bay Area adore him, you know. And he's, uh, I interviewed him, and I, some the drummer had done a lot of uh, clinics with Dean. And the drum tech knew me from Dr. Mastermind. And they said, you're, he said, he's a bass player. I, oh, really? I said, yeah. And said, oh, here's my bass. And I played it. And I go, this, how, what, how do you keep this from feeding back? He goes, let's go up and play. And plugged it in and had me his bass. And I started playing the first thing of Ace of Spades. And he grabs the neck and says, no, no, not that. It is some, but that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but he told me stories about selling acid to Hendrix and uh, all kinds of stuff. I don't know yeah. why that's feeding back. But because it's close to the microphone, that's why. But, I mean, it's not going through anything. Uh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> this is a weird well, interview. You know, if it doesn't work, let's do it again. Okay. Something's, you know, but anyhow. It's fun talking to you just anyway, man. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, let's see. Uh, Michael Jackson was one of the nicest people I ever worked with, which was, you know, I spent three days promoting their, when they, 
got signed from Motown to Epic. We promoted their first album. And it's been three days going around town promoting the promoting them with the radio stations. And he was such a nice dude. He turns to me at one point and says, do you have a girlfriend? And I go, yeah. He goes, what's her name? I go, Denise. And he, Michael friggin' Jackson, gets up, goes and gets a K, K, KYA, you know, the Hot 100 piece of paper. And he goes around to his brothers and has them all sign it to, my, to Denise who was my, she passed away 12 years ago and I saved it. My daughter, she loved Michael Jackson. So two years ago, I had that framed with my print of Michael Jackson because it's all to Denise, to Denise, to her mom, right? And um, it's one of her, one of her most precious pieces in her, in her house, you know? Was it on the, was it the Jackson 5 or was it the album, I want to rock with you? Oh, it was the Jackson nice. 5. I Jackson. love that band, man. I thought they were yeah. great. You see, yeah, the, the first one on uh, on Epic, on Epic Records. I don't remember the, what songs were on it. You know. No, I I, I jammed. I played. I played. You know, it was uh, since a stroke. I've uh, I exercised pretty much all day long. I play drums and run an exercise bike. And I play so a lot of Michael Jackson songs. And uh, like it's you know, music to me is like like I said, food. Yeah, uh, all kinds. I like some jazz fusion, and uh, I saw John McLaughlin and Ma Vishnu with Billy oh. Cobham. Uh, with the first Ma Vishnu back on yeah, the, the Blow by Blow tour. Uh, the first Ma Vishnu album is as good as it gets. <laughs> Whatever that song was, uh, you know, you'd probably get it. You remember that song? First first Mahavishnu album, Birds of Fire. Oh, yeah. yeah. Then there's the Intermounting intermounting Flame. Yeah. I like uh, Gentle Giant a lot, too. Yeah, I love the Mahavishnu orchestra. And Jeff Beck's a god, you know. Oh, to, me, yeah. the, to me, the great guitar players. Eric Clapton never did anything. He, he was great in the Yardbirds, and he was great in Cream and Blind Faith. But other than that, it bored me to death. I mean, the great guitar players are Peter Green, Jeff Beck. Uh, I love Ron Wood and the Faces. You know, love the Faces. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, those to me, that's the great guitar player. Hendrix, of course, but uh, but you know, to me, Peter Green is is the best. You know, anyhow, that's my taste. Well. <laughs> I guess uh, you want want to cut it here, and I'll talk about my book for a second, and then we'll we'll try it again in a couple of days. Okay, so Pat Johnson, you just put out a book called well about a year ago called Blue Collar Photographer, and it's got everybody in it, and it's got everybody saying quotes on the cover, and you can buy it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when Journey got inducted. Would Would you like to add anything else? Yeah, I'm I'm really proud of it. Uh thanks. Um you know, it's my life history. I mean, I was the Warriors photographer and I did a lot of giant stuff and I did all the comedians and I have like amazing blues people. But so this book is strictly music and it's there's each chapter is its own world. There's a chapter on hip hop, a chapter on, you know, blues guys sort of, a chapter on the Bammies, if you remember the Bammies. It, a chapter on whatever, you know, and how I started and journey and chapter on journey, because that's how I, you know, every, other people went to school to become a photographer. Well, journey was my first client. They were the Herbie Herbert hired me and said, you want to be our photographer? I didn't know what I, I, I didn't know whether to shit or get off the pot. I, so I, they, they were my school. I learned how to be a photographer photographing journey, you know, and my first studio fo photo, Herbie says, Hey, you want to, do our studio photos we need for the first journey of photo? I go, sure. Never did one in my life. So I just went and bought some lights and bought some paper and backdrop paper, put it up on my wall in, in San Francisco and shot my first publicity photo. First studio shot ever was journey. And most photographers in the music business would give their right arm to shoot journey at any point. And yet my first studio shot was journey. I didn't know what I was doing, but it worked. So, you know, I just, you know, I, I have to, you know, 
dedicate everything to my, to, he passed away two years ago, Herbie Herbert. If, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what I'd have been doing, selling insurance or something. No, and I wouldn't, but eh. cool. anyhow. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you can get the book at my, uh, my, and if you really don't even want to see the book, you can go to my website, patjohnson.com and just go through it. It's, it's a blast. It's like, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of portfolios. There's a portfolio on hip hop and a portfolio on this and a portfolio on that. So you can, you don't have to buy the book. You just go in there and have fun and groove on pictures. And if you want to get the book, you can get it there too. Cool. Comedians. I love comedy. I'm, oh, I, yeah. I do comedy as a guy named Madison Avenue. Uh, maybe that can be the next time we get together. Yeah. I got a, if you look at my website, there's a whole 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 section on comedy. You know, all the San Francisco. If you were you were probably you probably weren't here, but at that same time, San Francisco was the Liverpool of comedy. I mean, I mean, they all the up and comers all started here and stayed here, and they were like insane. You know, the punchline next to the old Waldorf. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there's yeah. Yeah, comedy makes you laugh, gets you out of your out of your thought process of the world falling apart or whatever. You know, we could use that right now. Yeah, I'll say. Well, hey, thanks a lot for coming on, Pat. I wish we didn't have technical difficulties, so uh, let's try it again and see if we can't get re remade. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, cool, man. Look, see you later. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. That was Pat Johnson, the author of, actually the photographer and author of a book that's got pictures of everybody. It's called Blue Collar Photographer, and you can look through it on his website, patjohnson.com. And uh, I urge you to do that because uh, he's a really great guy. He took the pictures for Wild Dogs, Man's Best Friend, and Dr. Mastermind. And... Uh, that's who we'll be talking today on uh, Tell Me About It. And uh, I want to thank you for tuning in and watching. And I'll see you later. Thank you. Good night. 